Today's passage comes from Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. John the Baptist said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. Whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the spirit of the Holy One and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Harsh words and good news would seem to be contradictory. After all, the birth of a grandchild is wonderful, something to celebrate. Then again, gestation and birthing, I am told, are not exactly pleasant experiences. We celebrate the end of a war with parades and festivities, Meanwhile, those living in areas ripped apart by the violence of war can't patch up everything overnight. We may celebrate profit and the increase of our portfolios, but the same may have come at a cost to others. One team wins the game, another crawls home in defeat. One survives cancer only to be left with lifelong repercussions. Perhaps good news and harsh words might be tied closer together than we are wont to believe. A few years back, I embarked on an economic study of the Hebrew Scriptures. I wanted to discern what the Bible actually taught on issues of economics. It was not something my seminary classes had really addressed. It was not something I'd ever heard tackled from the pulpit or in any of the various seminars and workshops and training events I had attended over the decades. It was not a chapter in our systematic theology texts. Sure, we talked about economics from the standpoint of how to encourage giving from people sitting in the pews. We talked about and prepared budgets. We discussed financial goals and mentioned tithing as a biblical standard. I knew as well that those topics did not do justice with some other things I had come up over against 
on the, over the years. My father had mentioned at least once that the Hebrew scriptures required more than simply tithing. Tithing was supposed to be on top of other required offerings and sacrifices, like the feast of first fruits or the various sacrifice days where animals were slaughtered and meat provided to the masses for them to eat at temple or tabernacle. Then there was, were the refrains in, in Job's comments about his righteousness, about his being a just man, refrains that revolved around his treatment of widow and orphan and immigrant, completely separate from required sacrifices and offerings. Those comments were about him being just and righteous and simply doing what was required of him as his life interfaced and interacted economically with the lives of others. I went through the Bible chapter by chapter and book by book with an eye focused on economic issues. I discovered a whole new reality that I had never before appreciated. Biblically speaking, justice cannot be addressed apart from our economic lives. Economics lie at the heart of our relationships with others. Our and their access to the necessities of life. The way we understand and wield power. What we call and consider important. Morality in the Hebrew scriptures is most visible in the ways we deal with economics, access to the building of wealth, and how we relate to others around it. These are moral issues because lives hang in the balance. Then we encounter John the Baptist's words here in Luke chapter 3. John begins calling the crowd who have come out to listen to him a brood of vipers. He doesn't pull his punches. He's direct and confrontational. Then again, Luke has portrayed a teenage Mary as responding to her cousin Elizabeth in poetic language worthy of Shakespeare. Luke is not giving us a transcription of John's words. This is no court stenographer's report of John's message there and the outlying regions of Judea. Luke is presenting the essence, the meaning, the importance of John as that voice clambering in the wilderness, prepare the way for the coming of Messiah. Do the hard work of preparing so that Messiah might come. John's declarations of repentance and renewal before Messiah are invoked as a minimum standard for the people. Not only should they declare their repentance, they should live their lives in recognition of that repentance, demonstrating renewal in the quality and character of their actions. Following and belonging to Yahweh needed to be made manifest in every aspect of their lives. What then should we do, they responded. How do we fix the mess that we have made? How do we correct the course to get back to what Yahweh expects of us? John's answer strikes me as anything but spiritual. 
at least according to any definitions I was given growing up for spiritual matters. John says nothing of prayer. John ignores sacrifice. John does not mention reading scripture. John does not address singing spiritual hymns or songs, fasting, prayer vigils, revivals, or preaching services. John does not mention any of those things we commonly consider practices of personal piety, holiness, and spirituality. He talks economics. Did you get that? His answer to what they were lacking spiritually was economic at its root. This is so different from all that happened in Ray Stevens' song about the Mississippi Squirrel Revival. John makes no mention of what we tend to think of as getting right with God. He didn't raise money for missions. He didn't send people off to preach in Africa. He did not call them to a life of monastic practices. He did not call for hooping and hollering, elaborate public prayers, public confessions of sin, a day of fasting, a national day of prayer, or even a parade through the streets of Jerusalem. He addressed issues of wealth. Economics is the category on which he pinned their belonging or not to Yahweh. What does a check register or a credit card statement say about us? Our relationships with others. How we address the world. How can I have a full pantry while a neighbor is hungry? Why do I have more than one coat while someone has none? For John, this was central to getting our lives on track with being the people we are called to become. Nothing in my seminary training or my church life prepared me to hear John espouse such a thing. Finances were not supposed to be questions of spirituality. Spirituality was about reading the Bible, meditating, praying, having a quiet time every morning, always talking about Jesus. John comes along and offers a harsh corrective to such definitions of spirituality. He gives it a series of economic rules to apply to our daily living. If you have more than one coat, give the other to someone in need. If you have food, share with those who don't. Don't use your position to extort others for your own enrichment and advancement. Be satisfied with the income you have. Don't just live to increase your earnings and amass wealth. (laughs) Those words would completely wipe out what we call the American dream, wouldn't they? They strike at the foundational principles of our society, our economic structures, our business models, what we call incentives for work, investment, and production. They're harsh words for people whose economic lives are built on radically different principles, values, and goals. John Wesley had related directives. He said, earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, give as much as you can. See, I heard that as good advice. What is more difficult is hearing that as spiritual practice. 
as living out my faith in practical ways a requirement for belonging to the people of God. Then Luke has the gall to call John's preaching good news. <laughs> oh, it's good news. It's wonderful news. It's just not good news for those of us who do not struggle for survival. It's good news for those whose lives are firmly ensnared by economic structures that would keep them at the bottom of the ladder of economic advancement. It places the burden for their well-being in our hands. So much for bootstraps. So much for rugged individualism. So much for making my own way and rising to the top by hard work, dedication, and struggle. So much for the American dream. The good news for those who struggle is that those who would follow Christ will help lift them up. Provide what they lack. Grant them full participation in the bounty of God's abundant provision. As harsh as it may sound, there is no, brace, no embracing that good news for the oppressed without assuming our responsibility to care.